The first of the three presentations we're going to go through this week, mm -hmm. it's probably the longest, um, uh, pretty, pretty quick on some of the others. But what I want to do, and I'm, I'm going to briefly go through this. I don't want to spend all my time kind of reading through all these charts. I want you to spend some time kind of digging into some of these different techniques that we present in this PowerPoint. But right now I'm going to go through some of the big topics. We're talking about risk, <clears throat> really one of the, the, the key elements of managing a successful I, IT project. Um, by definition, with analytics project or with any other project we're doing in technology, we're just something, we're still doing something that hasn't been done before. Um, thus there are going to be many knowns, uh, many unknowns and unknown unknowns that we're going to encounter. And all those things come across as risk. They can derail the project. They can significantly increase the time. Our management of those risks and our getting arms around it is key to making sure we stay on time, within budget, within and keep the scope, the main scope alive as we move forward through the project. So you can't just run a project and hope everything turns out. Risk management is critical to a success of a project. We talked about the main success factors in the first um, first section, executive support, user involvement, all these things. When you get into clearly defined and smaller scope, shorter schedules, um, a clearly defined project management process, all of these times and using a standard infrastructure, these are things that help to manage risk and are an element of keeping risk at a minimum uh, as the project progresses. Keep it smart, keep it simple, minimize your risk. That should be your mantra going into this thing. Always like like keep laser focused on keeping risk out of your project, and you will probably wind up being more successful than not. Standard standard infrastructure. When we talk about that, it's an element of whatever components of your project need to be put in place. Um, the technology needs to be put in place. If you use something that's already been done before, then there's less risk in it. There's always going to be risk in interfacing those kinds of things, but you you buy off a lot of risk when you buy something that someone has already figured out for the most part those components work together and they're going to execute given the architecture that they've defined. So keep it simple means avoiding risk. Once you've decided to pursue your capability, risk is your enemy. Uh, try to avoid it as much as possible. Don't add risk where you don't need to. The importance of risk management then, it's it's critical to the success of a technology project. It's the art and science when we talk about risk management, the art and science of identifying, analyzing, and responding to risk as it comes through. We're going to talk about some tools and techniques that you can use and also the process in general. Risk is often overlooked in projects. It isn't glamorous like, like software development or delivering kind of things or like risk. If, if everything goes well, you know, potentially people get they ignore the risk, the fact that it was well managed in risk. But the reality is for you to be successful as project management, this needs to be a critical part of how you approach the project. <clears throat> so what is risk? It's any uncertainty that can have a negative or potentially positive effect on meeting project objectives. We'll go a little bit into this project as, uh, with a, a positive risk. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. For the most part, though, what we're really concerned about are the negative unknowns because people tend to have a positive vision of what's going to be accomplished, right? They know what the end should look like. There's potential upside to that, but that's not what they really want and what they're paying for is that vision. Negative risks get in between you and that. So those are the things we're going to be focusing on with our project management um, process and minimize those potential negative risks. Risk utility. Just a chart here to talk about in your culture of your project. Understand what your company is asking for. Are they risk averse, risk neutral, or risk seeking? Meaning they're willing to pay a lot for potential upside if they're risk seeking or they're not willing to pay a lot for a, a potential upside and they just want that execution done and they're risk averse. So your management of risk needs to uh, be appropriate to whatever the culture of the project or the or the, uh, the company is that's paying for this project. Main set of processes here, your book goes into them. There's risk management planning, risk identification, qualitative risk analysis. Those are uh, uh, kind of the, the non-number uh, risks, things that could happen just on a binary scale. Quantitative, quantitative risk, meaning we have some impact that we can measure, risk response planning, and then risk monitoring and control. And we'll go into all of these uh, throughout the presentation and throughout the week. Different kinds of risk that you could have on a scoring sheet, let's see. Um, you've got market risk, you've got financial risk, technology risks, people risks. When you're doing your risk uh, identification, you want to be thinking through these types of risks and say, do we have stuff out there that we need to be thinking about? Don't just think about the fact that the product might work or that some some section of the technology might not work. Think about the people. What if you lose somebody? What if a main supplier drops out? What if the your handoff isn't good? The users move out from under you. You know, you get someone moves to a new job and the, the super user isn't there anymore to actually make it successful. What if the market changed underfoot? We'll talk about all those things. 
The potential negative risk conditions associated with each knowledge area are also can change as you go through. So think about the different knowledge areas that we've got. There's risks associated with those. Again, so when you're thinking about what you need to monitor and identify as potential risks that we should be tracking and trying to burn down, think about all the different knowledge areas and where we may be impacting those. So how do you go about identifying all these risks that you need to watch? It's the process of understanding what potential events might hurt or enhance a particular project. There are a number of techniques. I'm not going to go into details in each one. Suffice it to say, um, you have a number of ways that you can do it by yourself. You can do it with a team. You can use uh, experts. A lot of this depends on how much time and effort you want to spend on it. Brainstorming is the, the, the most common technique, really. A group attempts to generate ideas or find solutions. Um, you should have an experienced facilitator run a brainstorming session so you don't get into these sort of traps where you're kind of running the whole thing. Um, but, uh, uh, but also we want to, it also helps to avoid things like group think and, and, and inhibit, inhibited people, you know, kind of getting, not, not feeling like they want to share in overall risks. When you're doing brainstorming, think across all the different topic areas we just talked about in the last two charts. Delphi technique is another one where you get consensus from experts. So really it's like, it's reaching out to uh, experts across the organization and finding who really understands the project, and what they think are risks out there. This can be very useful, especially because you can be tapping into experiences from other people who've done similar kinds of things in the past on what they've what they've run into problems. Interviewing is uh, basically interviewing people with similar projects, so face to face. You know, what have you had in, in terms of risk, and what should we be thinking about? Once you get all that identified, you put it into a risk register, and this is one of your assignments this week. Main output of the risk identification is this register, and what it's going to do is list out. And I got a little sample below here. Uh, risks, you're going to number them, you're going to rank them in terms of their, their, their impact, you're going to describe the risk, give a description of it, maybe categorize it, say whatever the root cause is, what would trigger that risk? All right, so what do we know is going to cause it? Uh, or, or what's going to be the thing that, that elements that would pop it to the surface and make it become, move from being a risk to being an issue, right? What are our potential responses? So can we mitigate them um, um, ahead of time? You know, or we, can we have conditional responses in place, uh, ready to be uh, ready to be acted on? Who's the risk owner of that? And then probability and impact status. And those two really translate into um, a definition of what the risk really looks like in terms of the project effect. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a couple of charts. So qualitative risk analysis. This is assessing likelihood and impact of identified risks in terms of magnitude and priority. Risk quantification tools are like your probability impact matrices, top 10 risk item tracking that you do on a day on a weekly basis, or just expert judgment. And what it, what it means is you take each risk and you look at them basically in terms of two scales, the probability that's going to occur, and then the impact if it does occur. And as you see in these two different, these are really two different ways to represent the same thing down here. Um, creates risk factors. And what, what you see there is if you have low uh, you have a low probability of a risk, and it, if it does happen, it's going to have a low impact on the project. You're probably not going to spend a lot of resources worrying about it. If you have, on the other on the other hand, uh, a high risk on the right chart, you know, the one out there and floating in the middle of nowhere, or on the left chart, you've got some stuff, risk one and risk four, are there and high and high. That means there's high probability these risks are going to happen. And if they do happen, it's going to be a big problem. Okay, so those are ones that you want to spend a lot of resources on. Potentially some some uh, some of your margin operating margin uh, or your reserves right management reserves <clears throat> burning down those risks making sure you've got some conditional responses ready for them or doing some things to kind of counteract the risks themselves um, so that when they do come up if they do come up then you've got some way to make them you're constantly trying to move them down from that top right to the bottom left okay so if you can do some things to mitigate the risks up front then then maybe your impact goes from high to medium if you can do some things that'll possibly make them less likely to happen, then you move them from high to medium, right? You're constantly trying to move everything to the bottom left. That's what you use a top 10 risk item tracking for. So this is basically a mechanism to take that risk register that you had and say, all right, of that risk register, what are the key risks that we're working on this this week? And what are we doing about them? Okay. The here you kind of track each one, you, you track what the re risk resolution progress is. Are we making a difference in moving this thing to the bottom left each week? You do this periodic review of top 10 items so that you're constantly not only aware of these risks, but you're constantly moving them to the bottom left of your of the quadrant so that you're reducing overall risk to the project. Quantitative risk analysis is 
like qualitative, but it can be and it can be done together. But basically, this is where you can take and actually use some numbers to look at risks and decide which ones are the most important to you. So a decision tree is one way to look at this. Here you've got one that we do a lot for insurance companies or disaster recovery, those kinds of things, where you can say a combination of probability with a known cost of the outcome. Okay, so here you've got a decision. You say project one, the probability of this particular risk happening is 0.2. A probability of another one is 0.8 or the probability it doesn't happen is 0.8. You put uh, the cost of each, each thing there. So if it's three, going to cost 300000 to fix this risk if it happens, um, but the probability of that happening is only 0.2, then your estimated monetary value of that risk is 60000 Okay, so it's only 0.2 times 300. Um, and then you go down the line here and you kind of say, all right, so given all of this, Project 1's estimated monetary value in terms of risk is going to be is going to be 28,000. Project 2's is going to be 30,000. So you go with Project 2's. You kind of look at that to do some monetary estimates. If nothing else, it takes you away from just the gut check kind of calls and lets you look at how to, to quantify and manage some of these risks as they come through. Another method is sensitivity analysis. So here you want to look at something that has a, usually these are unit cost kinds of things. Like, um, there's a risk that our labor rates are going to increase because of some union negotiations going on right now. If they increase by this much, then here's the risk of the project being being profitable. If they increase by this much, here's the risk of the profit being profitable. That kind of thing is what you use for sensitivity analysis. Helps you determine break-even points for other decisions that you might need to make based on risks that are out there. After you identify and quantifying, then you have to figure out how to respond to them. There's four main ways. You can avoid them. Not a great approach. Um, uh, you can accept them and just build them into the cost. You can transfer them onto other projects if you're in a portfolio kind of arrangement or you can mitigate them. Transference means, look, I've got a, a sensor that I need developed for this. Um, I can't afford the risk associated with this, but this other project is a big project and they need the sensor too. I'm going to let them figure it out. And as long as they're done and they figure the whole thing out in time, it's no longer my risk. Risk mitigation means um, uh, uh, basically you're you're putting plans in place within your schedule to uh, to uh, deal with these risks as they come up. And you can do that for technical, cost, or schedule risks. Once you've figured all that out, you have to get into a monitoring and control process. This involves ex executing your risk management process to work through all these risk events. There is a, a top 10, the top 10 items is an element of your risk management process, right? Identifying them in the first place is an element of your risk man management process. There's two kinds of uh, uh, other elements we want to talk about. Workarounds, basically, as you figure out your responses, workarounds are unplanned responses to risk events that must be done when there are no contingency plans. So if you have contingency plans built into your risk management process, then you can execute those as mitigation. You may be in the position where I can't, there's no way to figure through this, so we're going to do a workaround. A lot of times that has a, an impact somewhere in scope. But your main outputs of risk monitoring and control are going to be all the requested changes, uh, corrective and preventative actions, and updates the risk register as you go forward, your risk management plan, and all your organizational project activities. So workarounds, as we said, they're ad hoc responses to the risk. They can be about the project, so there's going to be secondary risks that are possible. Um, you know, you do a workaround, and all of a sudden you've changed the course of the project in some way, so there may be other things that pop up. Or they can be about the product itself, which means that you potentially have a scope change. So if this window doesn't work or we can't get this thing, then they can key in you know, a particular value on the on the screen. That's a change in the product. Really, it isn't what they wanted, but maybe it's a workaround. It gets them going, you know, for the for the first initial delivery. Corrective actions are day-to-day -day changes that address risk. Then there are change requests that can go back into your scope, and then risk response plans and updates. The results of all this, unlike crisis management, which is bad, good project risk management often goes unnoticed. And if you do it that well, then it should look like you're just running a flawless project you know, with a perfectly aligned scope from the get-go. Um, Well-run well projects appear to be almost effortless, but a lot, of go work, a lot of work goes into running them. And behind the scenes, you're constantly working through these risks, making sure they don't have an impact on your developers or on your customers. Project managers should always strive to make the jobs look easy as a result of good, well-run uh, risk management processes and well-run projects. So that's it for risk.